celebrate the birth anniversary of Sir Charles Darwin. Uh, Charles Robert Darwin was an English naturalist, geologist, and biologist, widely known for his contributions to evolutionary biology. His proposition that all species of life have descended from a common ancestor is now generally accepted and considered a fundamental concept in science. Today we have with us Dr. Ananta Bhadra, Associate Professor, Department of Biological Sciences, Iser Kolkata. Uh, on behalf of Science City, I welcome you, Dr. Ananta. A very warm welcome to you. Uh, Dr. Ananta uh, will talk on the why questions in biology. The topic itself is so interesting and invokes so much of curiosity. So without much delay, handing over the platform to Dr. Ananta. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Lovelyn, and it's a pleasure to be here, uh, though virtually. I hope I will uh, be able to get some students here at least a little more curious about evolution and Darwin. Uh, that is the idea of uh, today's talk. So I have uh, kept it kind of uh, open for questions. So if anybody has a question uh, in the middle while I am uh, talking, Please don't hesitate to uh, ask. See, when I will be presenting, I cannot see you on the screen. Uh, but I would prefer that uh, people ask the questions when they think about the question and not later, because then the question often gets lost. Okay, And the idea is that uh, we keep this uh, interactive. Uh, don't, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be preaching here. I rather want you to be uh, listening and asking questions. Because no, my actually, uh, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, yeah. uh, but uh, we don't give the option of unmuting in between the lecture. And, okay, uh, uh, but in that case, they can maybe forward, type their questions. They can type in the chat. Yes. Yeah, so but if they type... If you want to type in the chat, you can type a message in the chat. Right. So if there's a question that you think needs to be asked while uh, the talk is going on, Lovelyn, you can ask the question on behalf of the student. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure ma'am. Sure. Uh, because uh, otherwise, uh, I don't even know whether uh, you know I'm reaching out to them because I'd like to have some feedback. Um, I would like to st stop seeing this panel on top. Is that possible? Uh, which Typically, there's now? a hide button. Uh, when I'm presenting, I have this panel with the mute and video and everything. Usually, uh, we... Vishal, can you please help her? Uh, Typically, yes, there's a hide button. I cannot see that. Okay, you are not, uh, that option is not visible in your screen, Ramana. No, is it? the hide that okay. panel button is not visible. Okay, can you reshare uh, again? Okay. Uh, is it visible, ma'am, right now? Just a minute, I'm just trying to share again. Share. No, it's okay. We can live with it. Not a big problem. Okay. So, uh, students, uh, yesterday was uh, Charles Darwin's birthday, and I'm very happy that uh, people are interested in commemorating his birthday. So, we call this the Darwin Day. And uh, in my talk today, I'm trying to go give you an overview of why uh, we still think of uh, Darwin as an important scientist, why we try to commemorate his birthday, why we try to remember him and acknowledge him, and what kind of uh, work did he do that is still relevant today. Uh, so that is the kind of overview of the talk, and I'm going to try and place it in the context of what we think of as biology and what else could be you know, out there, which sometimes we uh, you know, kind of miss out in our studying of biology. So if you look around, then no matter where you are and what kind of life forms you see, I'm sure all of you are going to definitely register that there is a lot of variation, uh, whether it's in the plant kingdom or in the animal kingdom. So over the next few slides, I'm just going to show you a few images. In this case, you see flowers, tulips to be precise, uh, in a field where you see that there is variation. And of course, you can note that the first level of variation that you think of, if you see this image, is variation in color. If you would go a little deeper, you would probably notice that it's not just the color, but sometimes the shades of the same color uh, can appear in different flowers. 
If you look even closer, you might find that some plants are taller than the others. Uh, some plants have more leaves than the others. Some flowers are bigger than the others, so on and so forth. So these are various biological characters through which you can see variation being registered. Here too, you have a large number of leaves. In fact, interestingly, if you see this image, for each leaf that you can see, there is also a seed or an acorn. So you see here there's a, uh, a leaf and then next to it is the acorn or the seed or the, or the cone of the uh, plant. So here this image again tries to register that there are variations in the leaf shapes, sizes, patterns of uh, the leaves, the different shapes the leaves have taken, the shades of green and the leaf, so on and so forth. A very, very uh, nice example is that of beetles. Uh, I have specifically used beetles because many of you would not know probably that Darwin, uh, when he was uh, your age, he used to collect beetles. A lot of people in early days used to have this hobby of collecting beetles because beetles are colorful, they're easy to grab and catch and keep. And uh, you can have a really beautiful collection of beetles of different colors, shapes and sizes. So uh, beetles again come in all of these uh, different varieties and of course, many, many more. Uh, this image is uh, very interesting because if you see here, these are very weird structures, right? These are coleopterans and again, relatives of beetles, but they look quite scary. Uh, and again, you see here that these horn-like structures come in different shapes, sizes, and uh, whatever level of uh, being how dangerous they look. Bird beaks, very close uh, relatives of each other, but can have different beaks, uh, shapes and sizes. And very soon I'm going to talk to you about one particular example of birds, uh, which are very closely related, but have very different beaks and how it is connected to Darwin. So think about walking into this forest. Close your eyes and imagine you are standing right here in the middle of this patch. Uh, if you start thinking of what are the kinds of life that you are going to see here, can people start typing in what are the different life forms you would expect? This is a rainforest, a tropical forest. Uh, so, you know, something you might get, uh, for example, if you go to the Western Ghats in India. So if you walked into a forest like this, what are the different kinds of life forms that you will see? Can I see uh, this in the chat box, please? Better up message kar sakte ho chat me. Yes. Can you put uh, just a word, you know, what life forms would you think you will see if you walk into this rainforest? Whatever comes to your mind, the first uh, creature or uh, living being that comes to your mind, just put it in the chat box. Let me go take a look at the chat box. Birds. Okay. Birds. Okay. Anyone else? What else? Insects, birds, different plants. Okay. What different plants? You don't have to give me names, but what, how will the plants be different? You can see them in the image itself, actually. What kind of different animals? What do you expect in a forest like this? Would you find a lion here? Foxes, bears, lion. No, no lions. Lions cannot live in this kind of territory. What about elephants? Come on, virtual Box. trip to a forest. Okay, no elephants, okay. Flowers, very good.
Anything else? Herbs, okay. Okay, uh, let's move on. Yes, you will find uh, different kinds of uh, animals and plants. And if you notice in this photograph carefully, you will see that there are already different tires at which the trees and plants are growing. So there are some tall trees, there are some at the middle level, and there would be some at the basal level. And there would be very interesting uh, plant behaviors to study in terms of how they try to reach out to the sunlight, how they're competing for food, how the various flowers are flowering and competing for the attention of pollinators, so on and so forth. Okay, now, out of the forest and I take you to this pond. If I ask you now, if you are standing at the edge of this pond and looking at this picture, what can you see? What plants and animals can you see? Or you imagine would be there, but you can't see. Trees, duckweed, okay. Lotus, water lily, frogs, hydra, okay, algae, frogs. Achhi tarah se dekhe, beech mein kuch hai, photo mein. Photo ke beech mein kuch hai. Rhino, unlikely. Yes, there are ducks. Absolutely lotus. Yes, good, you've spotted the ducks. Okay, so now let me ask you a different question. You can see all of this, right? There are ducks, there are frogs in the water, there are lotuses, there are different kinds of uh, other plants. You some said hydra, algae. Now, can you fr frame some questions about what we call this habitat, you know, what you are seeing around you. If you were, were to go and stand at the edge of this pond, can you think of some questions that come to your mind? About this place, of course. Give me a question. Could be. Any question that you can think of. Virtually standing here. Is this water fresh, okay? What does it mean by fresh? If it's pond water, it is fresh water, technically, but what do you mean by fresh? Is the water clean, right? And how will you find out if the water is clean? You have to collect some samples and uh, put them through some tests, right? Good, what else? How could the organisms breathe inside it, right? So depending on what kind of organisms we are talking about, we have to check for what are the mechanisms by which they breathe. How can we conserve this for the future? Very good question. Is the water polluted? That is kind of whether it is clean or not. If it's not, it might be polluted. Is the pond safe for swimming? Okay, when you say safe, is it because you're thinking about the water being dirty or you're thinking of something else in the water? Fit for drinking, okay. Can't you think beyond the water? What about all the plants and animals you saw? Food chain, excellent. Who eats whom? Any other questions? How long will the organism survive in this kind of water? Okay, good question. How the lotus can float on the water? Good question. Okay, so if you think about all the questions you've been asking, you are basically trying to understand something, a process or something that you're visualizing right now, and you want an explanation for this. 
right? So, if I move on, in biology, we typically call these the how questions, like how can the animals breathe? Uh, how, how, how can I swim in this water? How can the lotus float on the water? So these are called how questions or proximate questions. Now, if you think a little deeper, sometimes we want to ask why questions. For example, why does the lotus float in the water and not grow in the land? Or why does a rose bush not grow in the water, right? That is a very valid question. Why is the lotus in the water and why is the rose on the land? Or why is it that uh, tadpoles live in the water and uh, frogs, the adults of these tadpoles, live on the ground? So you can always ask something beginning with a why. And when we are asking these why questions or the ultimate questions, that is where we are basically trying to understand the connections between what we see here, the proximate mechanisms, how an animal lives, what an animal eats, uh, how long a plant survives. These are the proximate or the how questions. When we are trying to answer deeper down, why has something become the way it is? There we are trying to understand the evolution of that organism, its past in terms of its evolutionary history. And that is where evolution becomes very important because that is the connecting thread which helps you understand all of biology in a logical sense. Now, it is not that Darwin was the first person who ever th started thinking about the process of evolution. In fact, if you have seen younger children at home, if you've had a kid brother or sister or a niece or nephew, you would notice that children, I'm sure even you did, ask a lot of questions beginning with why. You know, why are there stars in the sky? Uh, why cannot I eat this food? Oh, well, why should I go to sleep now? Everything starts with a why. And this I'm telling you because humans by nature are curious. And very often children try to understand, you know, why are you know you asking me to do this? And why are you asking me to do that? Or why is something like the way it is? And this curiosity often leads them to ask, where did I come from? You know, where was I before I came here? So this is a very philosophical question, but often little children ask these kind of questions. So humans, again, in our long, long past, always have been curious about nature around them because they survived by learning to understand nature around them, which animals to hunt, how to hunt. The, uh, uh, uh. So if you were going to hunt a mammoth versus if you were going to hunt, uh, uh, for example, uh, a rabbit, you would have very different means of hunting. You would have very different means of processing the food and you would really need to know the nature of the animal. Or if you pick a berry, whether to eat it or not, you would really need to understand what kind of plant this is, how to identify edible foods versus inedible fruits, something that is poisonous versus non-poisonous. So people were always observing nature. And obviously, people have wondered, some people have at least wondered about why are there so many kinds of fruits or plants or animals? Why uh, is there so much variation in nature? So I'd like to tell you about this person, uh, his name was uh, Anamic, uh, Anaximander. Uh, sounds a bit like a character out of uh, J.K. Rowling's books uh, from a place called Miletus. And if you see here in the dates, he was living around uh, 600 BC. So this is like 2,600 uh, uh, years ago. And this person and this uh, stone kind of statue that which has been found is thought to be of him or a representation of him was basically a philosopher. And he came up with this idea that the earliest animals lived in the water. So animals moved from the water to the land and occupied the land, but the earliest animals lived in the water. And he was probably basing his argument on the fact that there were still animals like fish in the water. And he thought that fish are uh, more uh, adapted to the water and more primitive than uh, animals which live on land, like the reptiles and mammals and birds. In fact, he even said that entire races of humans must have come from another animal. So 
very, very vague idea of life forms changing from one form to another. That is what evolution is all about. Now, these images, I'm sure no, need no introduction to the audience. All of you can tell me what these are. Come on. What are they? Yeah, dinosaurs. Now, have you ever seen a dinosaur? Anyone living here has been seen a dinosaur? No. But when I tell you that they existed, you accept it, right? How do we know that dinosaurs uh, existed and though they don't exist anymore? Why do we believe that dinosaurs were there? How do we know that they were there and there were so many different kinds? Fossils, excellent. You know everything. Fossils are the answer. We have found fossils and that is how we know that dinosaurs existed. Now, if they existed, where did they go? We know they became extinct, right? And there have been many ideas about why dinosaurs became extinct. We probably have a good understanding now that there was once a meteor strike, a massive meteor strike on Earth, which created a huge uh, disturbance in the Earth's atmosphere. There was a lot of dust and smoke uh, which was hanging around and the sun got covered because of which there was a huge problem. Dinosaurs are reptiles, right? They are cold-blooded animals. When the sun was covered for days and weeks and months, the temperature fell and dinosaurs could not survive in this low temperature for long. Also, uh, the, in addition to that, of course, many other animals and plants did not survive because of the lack of oxygen, because of the uh, lack of sunlight, and dinosaurs did not have enough food. So all of this put together, the, it is now understood that the meteor strike was the key cause why the dinosaurs went extinct. So when you see a fossil, and this is a real fossil, by the way, of a dinosaur, when you see a fossil, you can get a lot of information from it. So people who study fossils, anyone knows what they're called? Scientists who study fossils, what are they called? Anyone? Dinosaur pinger? What is a person studying a fossil called? Paleontologist, very good. So paleontologists, uh, are the people who really study fossils. Archaeologists are really people who study uh, ancient structures. So fossils of civilizations and fossils of animals are different things. Archaeologists uh, study old buildings, monuments, and things like this. Uh, paleontologists study fossils of, uh, of living creatures from the past. They are, they are very similar in what the kind of questions they are answering, but they actually are from very different fields. When you see a fossil, often you don't get a fossil which is so beautiful intact. In this case, the dinosaur probably died in a, a volcanic eruption and the entire dinosaur got fossilized. And uh, th this is marvelous, right? But most often we find a bone here and a bone there and a bone somewhere else. And then people try to figure out which which are the bones of the same individual, which belong to the same species, it takes a many, many, many years of practice and training. And then they can go back and date the bones that they find using silicon dating, radiocarbon dating, and say what period, how many hundreds of years ago this animal lived. In addition to that, we can find out the different connections between these animals and animals of today. So how do we know that they're reptiles? Because we know reptiles have certain body structures. Uh, we know that the dinosaurs and the lizards of today are not much different. They are, of course, much different in size, but in uh, their body structure, in their morphology, in their uh, uh, food habits, in how they lived in being cold-blooded, they're all very similar. So we put them as reptiles, even ha without having seen a single whole dinosaur ever. Just to show you some more beautiful pictures of fossils. So this is uh, 
as you can see, I'm sure you can make out, this is a fossilized fish. Uh, this is a, uh, 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 not, not really a snake, it is more like a tapeworm. These are ferns and these are gigantic mollusks, like huge shells which have been fossilized. So you can go to museums and see such fossils. Uh, I don't know if museum around you has uh, fossils like this, uh, but we do have museums in India which have fossils. In fact, where I live uh, near to Kolkata, the, in Kolkata there is the Indian Museum. So if you ever come with your parents to visit Kolkata, definitely go to the Indian Museum and check out. They have really beautiful collection of fossils, including bones of dinosaurs. Not an intact dinosaur, of course. So. Again, fossils have been known for many, many years because whenever people dug either to build or to find something, they would find fossils. So in Greece, in Persia, in China, independently, there were different people who have found fossils. They knew what these are and they were trying to see whether the animals impressions that they see in these fossils can be connected to the history of life on earth. So this is a connection philosophers had made long, long time back. And it was around the time to the 17th to 18th century that this entire field of paleontology started growing. And in the 18th century, a very famous person, a paleontologist known as Georges Cuvier, he was the first one who really made this connection that what is there in the fossil was living at one point of time until they became extinct. And he was the founder of this field of paleontology. And after him, his students and many others started getting into this field and studying fossils in earnest. Now I'm going to switch gears and tell you about something that humans have been practicing again for a very long, long time without really thinking about evolution or genetics or anything. So this is called artificial selection. Uh, I'm sure there are many people in this audience who like dogs. So anyone here who hates dogs? Yes, snakes do have bones, lots of bones. Okay, anyone here who does not like dogs? One person does not like dogs. Anyone else? Because they bite and they bark? Okay. Still looks like a minority. They smell, okay. If they don't bathe your dog nicely, then they'll definitely smell. Okay. How many of you have pet dogs at home? <laughs> the way they lick. So, uh, Lovelyne, can they raise hands? Is that allowed? Uh. The raise hand button is allowed to them? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is allowed to them. Okay. If they want, they can raise. So people who have uh, yeah, Ishita pet dogs. Has raised hand. Okay, yes. I'll unmute you, Ishita. No, you don't have to unmute. I, I'm just uh, trying to understand okay, okay. what proportion of this group has pets at home. How many of you have pet dogs? Just raise your hands quickly. Three. Okay, not too many. Uh, okay, now if you look at this image here, you can see, of course, these are different breeds of dogs, right? And some of them look so different from each other that you would not believe that they are all the same species. But the fact is that all dogs, no matter what breed you look at, at across the world, it might be the tiny, tiny Chihuahua or it might be the huge Great Den, all of them are the same species of dogs. So all we see here on the screen are what are called breeds. And breeds are produced through the process of artificial selection. They are man-made. So I like to have dogs with a lot of fur. I have a set of dogs in which I pick the ones which have more fur than the others. And I then you know, make them mate. And then their offspring, I again pick the most fluffiest one, and I again make them mate, and so on and so forth. Several generations down the line, I start getting a lot of dog uh, puppies with more fur uh, as opposed to initially. And this is how people have been breeding animals and in fact plants for centuries. So even before we understood genetics, 
Now we know this is in the genes. And much before people understood genetics, animals and plants were being bred. So dogs are a classic examples of, uh, example of artificial selection, as are, for example, cows, horses, all the animals that people have domesticated, either for their milk or their uh, you know, ability to run faster or their meat, people have selectively bred them for certain traits. So uh, for example, if you look at what are known Jersey cows, right? If you look at a standard normal cow, a domestic cow that, uh, uh, for, for example, in India, a domestic cow would probably give uh, maybe three, three liters of milk a day which itself is quite more than what cows should produce at one time. Because remember, an animal produces milk for feeding its baby. So the milk should be enough to feed one offspring in case of the cow. But then we have bred them and bred them and bred them and raised them to give more milk. And now you have what we call Jersey cows, which can give you 15, 16 liters of milk in a day. No uh, uh, cow will have an offspring which will drink that much of milk in a day. So this is where artificial selection can come in, where animals and plants can be made to order literally to suit what we want. A very classic example, which most of us would not even imagine to be true, is that of the common wild mustard. Sarsoka saag to ablo khate yonge. Now, if I tell your parents or if I tell you that uh, cabbage and cauliflower, patta gobi and gobi, both of them are from the same plant, you know, they'll think I'm mad, right? If I go and tell you that uh, the, the broccoli and the cauliflower are sim the same, they'll say, no, they're similar, but they're not the same. But the fact is that very, very early on, people took the wild mustard the normal sarso that we see. Uh, and they have crossbred plants for different parts so that when you have selection for large leaves, you get this one kind of sag, which is called kale or kale. When you breed for fat stems with flowers, you get broccoli. When you selectively breed for larger and larger and larger flowers, you eventually get cauliflower. Imagine, aapke ghar ka jo sarso ka saag hai, usme jo chote chote yellow flowers hote. That eventually became the cauliflower, the gobi. Uh, breeding for the terminal bud, plant ke ek dem tip mein jo bud hota hai, because uh, uh, that helps the plant to grow, grow uh, tall, they bred for fatter and fatter buds. So the plant did not grow this way, the plant grew this way. And that gave rise to the cabbage. Uh, Brussels sprouts came from similar growth of the lateral buds from which the plants uh, stems and leaves come out. And then you have uh, kohlrabi, which is fattening of the stem. So imagine, in fact, root, uh, fattening of the roof, root gave rise to radish. So imagine one plant which has been bred and uh, artificially by humans hundreds of years ago gave rise to these various kinds of vegetables, which we grow and eat now from their own plants, right? You don't plant a mustard plant to uh, make a cauliflower, of course, because now we have cauliflowers and cabbages and broccoli as separate individual plants, but all of them came from the mustard. So this is the mustard flower. I'm sure I don't want to, I don't need to introduce this to people in Punjab. So this is called selective breeding or artificial selection, where you selectively decide which plant or animal mates with which plant or animal. And that is how you produce different traits that you would like to uh, exaggerate or amplify. Now, I'm trying to highlight that in nature, without us interfering in any way, there is a lot of variation. Uh, some of the examples that I showed you uh, at the beginning of the talk. And now we know from fossils that life forms can become extinct, right? And at the same time, new variations can occur in nature, which is very important. It is not that you start with something and you cannot change. Variations are the essence of life and variations can happen over time. And now we understand most of these variations happen because of mutations. 
So all of this put together, new life forms uh, uh, giving rise to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, life forms giving rise to new variations, life forms going extinct, life forms changing from one kind to another kind, all of this together is what is evolution. So life forms do evolve. Before uh, we go to Darwin, we should think about the earlier ideas about evolution. And the person who's most famously known is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. So he was uh, uh, a little ahead of Darwin, a little before Darwin. He gave this theory, which is now called Lamarckism, which has three components. He said that organisms can have body parts, which they use a lot. They might have parts which they don't use at all. Now, uh, if you are not using something, then over generations, this uh, body part might actually become redundant. And he used the example of vestigial organs. You know, all of us have an organ called the abdomen, uh, called the appendix, which has apparently no purpose in our bodies anymore. Only thing is, sometimes the appendix gets infected and you need to go through an appendicitis, which is a surgery to remove the appendix. And once you remove the appendix, you are fine. But then this is a vestigial organ. Nobody knows why it is there, but it's there. So uh, Lama gave the example of vestigial organs to say, if you don't use uh, something for a long time due to disease, these uh, organs can become smaller and smaller and might vanish. Second thing he said is very important. Then when in a lifetime of an organism, this organism gains certain characters, these characters should be inherited by its future offspring. And he said that organisms have this inherent drive to become more complex. So as if like a plant says, OK, I want to become a more complex plant or a, a butterfly says, I'm not happy being a butterfly. I want to be a bird. So it is as if there's an urge in every organism to more become more and more complex. Now, the classic example that people take to explain Lamarckism is the elongation of the giraffe's neck. We know from fossils that ancestors of giraffes did not have this fantastically long neck. So if you look at Lamarck's ideas, the idea is that originally there were short neck giraffes, but then giraffes started stretching their necks to reach leaves which are high up. And in doing so, they were using their longer necks and stretching out their necks so often that they started producing offspring with longer necks. And eventually the giraffes became what we see today. However, now, after understanding Darwinism and after understanding mutation and inheritance, we know that just a giraffe wanting to make its neck taller would not have made the giraffe's neck taller. I like to highlight this example that if we believed in using disuse and inheritance of acquired characters, then uh, somebody who has built his muscles for whatever purpose should give birth to a son with already built muscles. So Amir Khan and, her, and his son do not have similar, similar muscles. Amir Khan's muscles built for the film Ghazni, but his son had no muscles to show uh, for his father's uh, uh, work. So if you have uh, Lamarckism, then you would expect Amir Khan's son to be having Amir Khan-like muscles uh, just because he happened to, happens to be his father. But this, we all know, is not true. So. Some years after Lamarck comes into the scene, Charles Darwin. Uh, as we said, we celebrated his birthday yesterday. So the images are of Darwin at various ages, as you can see. And the image here in the middle is Darwin when he went on his famous voyage of the HMS Beagle. It's very interesting. I always tell students that Darwin sets an example of how uh, you know, studying hard and getting good marks and, uh, you know, uh, do, doing something just because you have to uh, study for exams does not always uh, make you a good, stu good student and uh, successful in your career. And not excelling in your studies does not always make you a loser. Darwin is an example. His family wanted him to be a doctor, but he could not stand the sight of blood. So he did not like the idea of being a doctor. His family sent him off to study to become a clergyman. So to get into the church to become a priest, you need to go through a, 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 a lot of education. So you have to be, be at least a graduate in uh, theology. And so he went off to study theology. But 
His passion was actually in observing nature. Ever since he was a kid, he used to follow around his grandfather, a very famous naturalist, Erasmus Darwin, uh, take long walks in the woods, collect his beetles, and generally sit and watch life. And he wanted to, he loved uh, doing nature watching. And when he was in the university, he made a lot of friends with people in other departments. And he would hang around with the bird watchers and the uh, uh, beetle uh, collectors, but uh, ended up not really studying much in his course. Eventually, he got this offer from a family friend to join this voyage in this ship, which was looking for a naturalist. Those days, ships went exploring in the sea. Most of them were trying to come to our part of the world. And they would have a person who will be documenting whatever new life forms they see whenever wherever they go. So they wanted a naturalist. So the HMS Beagle wanted a naturalist. So Darwin had a bunk to sleep on, uh, free food, no salary. And he want, had to serve as the naturalist of the ship. And this is like a God-given opportunity to him. He jumped up and joined the, uh, the, the voyage. So this ship started this journey from Plymouth in the UK. It went down all the way to the tip of South America and uh, made this round and came to what we call the Galapagos Islands. And then, of course, you know, the Earth is round. So eventually it came below Australia, climbed up, went to Mauritius, touched Cape Town, touched uh, the, the, this uh, easternmost tip of South America and went back to Plymouth. So this trip was expected to be a short one. It was originally planned to be uh, uh, one year or one and a half years, but eventually it took about two and a half years for Darwin to come back. Uh, sorry, it took about uh, five and a half years. So he started, I'm sure, sorry, you can't see this. Uh, this thing goes off and comes back again. So, sorry, I have done something. So uh, he started his uh, voyage in December uh, 1831 and ended in October 1836, uh, nearly five years. And then uh, in this voyage, what I want to highlight is this island of the Galapagos, where this is actually a collection of islands. These are Galapagos Islands or an archipelago, where he encountered very, very fascinating animals which the world did not know about. One of these is the giant tortoise, this, till date, is the largest living species of tortoise. Uh, it can be about 400 kgs in weight in its full size, uh, almost six feet long. And uh, on record, uh, the, of a captive individual has lived for 170 years in the zoo. So at least 400 years they can live. And these tortoises, as you saw, that they're all, all on these islands, they're walking around, they did not uh, know humans, so they were not even scared. And it is even mentioned in one of his diaries that he even took a ride on one of these tortoises. And he actually noted that on different islands, that the tortoises seem to be a little different in how their shells look and what they're eating, etc. Another uh, so this is actually a, a photograph from the Galapagos Islands of the present day. You can see how beautiful they are and people go there on uh, vacations. And there you can see that there's this huge lizard. It's called an iguana. It's a marine lizard, a very rare uh, uh, reptile, which is a marine uh, lizard. And you can find them there even now. Again, very large animals uh, uh, that Darwin had never seen before. Nobody actually knew of their existence. Another bird which Darwin described for the first time on these islands, you see these birds, they look somewhere between a duck and uh, uh, you know, a dove, and they have these pointed her heron-like beaks, and they have blue feet. So they are, uh, they call they are called the blue-footed booby. Uh, very in interesting, blue underbelly and blue feet. Nowhere else you see this blue color. And again, these are found only in the Galapagos Islands. I'd say that I will talk about a bird and uh, uh, beaks when I talk about Darwin. So Darwin noted that there are these birds which are called finches, which are known from South America and Central America. So he found that there are these finch-like birds on these islands. And 
he made elaborate drawings and you see here all of these are finches but they have very different beaks all of these beaks are different and in addition to this there are different uh, kinds of changes in their uh, the dif different variations in their colors and their f feathers etc but darwin was really struck by the different kinds of beaks that these birds have and when he sat down and made observations, he also saw that each bird with a different kind of beak was eating a different kind of food. So, for example, this one, the brown, it is called the ivy. It feeds on nectar from the ohia flowers. It has this curved and pointed beak, which it can dip inside the flower tube and drink the nectar. Uh, the parrot bill. It has a bill like a parrot, but it is not a parrot, it's a finch. And what it does, it, it uses this beak to tear open box of trees and eat beetles, which are living inside the box of trees. Uh, the Nihoa finch, which has a very uh, short and thick and hard beak, and this beak it can use to crush seeds. Uh, the Amakihi Amaki is again a nectar feeder. Uh, this is the original species of finch. You see here what a, its beak looks like. Something like a mena's beak, a little uh, longer than a mena's beak. The bird is almost like a mena. And from this beak, you see these many variations. So Darwin noted that there are these 13 species in the Galapagos Islands, and he made detailed notes. And he started wondering whether these are from the same uh, species or are how did these birds come, uh, come into being, which are found only in the Galapagos and nowhere else. So eventually he went back and he wrote this book, which was published later in 1859, uh, which is called The Origin of Species uh, by Means of Natural Selection, where he gave uh, his idea. But I must mention to, together with Darwin, a person called Alfred Russell Wallace, who came up with ideas very similar to Darwin's at the same time by exploring a different set of islands, which is the Malay archipelago, the Malaysian islands. So he worked mostly in the Malay archipelago and New Zealand, and he came up with similar ideas and his book was published one year later. And uh, the idea of what we call Darwinism, which must note it is technically called the Darwin Wallace theory, because the two of them presented this idea to the scientific community at the same time. So what did Darwin's book say? this big fat book, but if you come down to the major postulates of Darwin's theory, he says there is variation in nature. All animals and plants for that matter have tendency to over reproduce. So when you see a lot of kittens being born to a cat, a lot of puppies being born to a dog, don't expect that all of them will survive because they're not supposed to. There is over reproduction and then there is competition for survival between these individuals. Now he says, if there is a change in the existing environment, then because of the existing variation, some forms will be better suited to live in the new environment than the others. This will give rise to adaptation and eventually survival of the fittest by means of natural selection, which basically will give rise to new species. Let me explain this with uh, a quick example. Everybody knows the polar bears, right? They are, they are white and they live in the poles, which is full of snow. Where did the polar bears come from? Now we know that all bears had brown bear-like ancestors, okay? Now came the Ice Age. I'm sure all of you know what the Ice Age is, at least through, uh, uh, if not through your studies, but through the Ice Age films, that there was a large part of the earth covered in ice. Now imagine the seals are what the bears ate in those areas. Now, if you are a brown bear trying to sneak up to a fish or a seal and the background is white, the contrast is so stark that your predator will see you from a great distance and run. So what will happen to these brown bears? The brown bears will not find it easy to hunt and find food. So they will either die of starvation or they'll have to migrate to areas where there is not that much snow, where they can still hunt and survive. And this is what is expected to have happened. Bears with the brown fur started moving towards the equators from the poles so that they could uh, 
avoid being detected by their predators and they started adapting to the new habitat. But when there is ice and then when there is a white bear hiding in the ice, the prey cannot run away easily. And so imagine now among the population of bears, there was variation. Some had white fur, some had brown fur, some had brown and white fur. So the ones which had white fur got an advantage, an unfair advantage of being able to hunt much better because of which we eventually have polar bears, which have evolved after that from these ancestors. And eventually now you have only polar bears in the poles. So I will conclude Darwin's uh, part by showing you this. This is a diagram that Darwin made in his diary. So he basically says, imagine there is this one species and then changes happen. And so it is like the branch of a tree, one branch happens and this branch eventually branches more and more. This main trunk grows and there are branches happening everywhere. And this is how from one species one, we can have A, B, C, and D, different species which arise through the process of evolution. And he writes in his book, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So this is how he summarizes his ideas about what evolution really is. And remember, at this time, nobody really believed in this. And also, he was giving this idea to the Christian world who believed that it is God who created Adam and Eve and all other forms of life and created uh, uh, you know, all life forms on Earth. So Darwin is trying to portray that from an early beginning, uh, eventually evolution gave rise to this variety of life forms that you see around us. And then, of course, Darwin, in his next book, The Descent of Man, he tried to explain that humans also have come from monkey-like or ape-like ancestors. If you see modern humans, this is what a skull of a modern human looks like. Our immediate past ancestor is the Neanderthal man. You see, even in the skull shape, there are much differences. Huge number of human and humanoid fossils have been found and recorded uh, across the world. In fact, human evolution is something where knowledge keeps growing. Uh, every few years, a new fossil is uh, found and a new piece is added to this jigsaw puzzle. A couple of years back, a new fossil was found. Uh, and uh, this is how the human history becomes more and more complex when we try to study them. Uh, the fossil of Lucy is uh, something, again, which is very famous. It was found in 1974, uh, which gave uh, the date of early humans in Africa uh, through uh, the, the, this fossil. It was dated back to 32 lakh or 3.2 million years ago. And we know that 3.2 million years ago, we had uh, humans or ancestral humans who were bipedal. They could walk on two legs. So there's a lot that we now know about human evolution and still a lot that we don't know. Anyone who is interested, you can go and find out uh, all about human evolution and the different ancestors and the relatives that we share our lives with. So humans and chimps, we share 98.8% of our genes. Only that little bit of 1.2% makes us different from chimps and that is such a huge amount. And we also share a large person of, uh, uh, percentage of our genes with gorillas, orangutans, and all monkeys. And then apes and monkeys are 93% similar all over. So if you look at all human races across the world, between all human races, if I go to some, go and uh, measure my genetic relatedness with people in Africa, Australia, New Zealand, South America, North America, overall human races are 99.9% .9 similar. So all of these differences that you see in color, hair, eye, body build, all of these racial differences come from this 0.1%. Imagine how big that can be. Just to tell you, there is this extremely interactive and beautiful page on human evolution. If you just search human evolution and Smithsonian, you will get uh, this hit and you can go and 
click on each of these images and that will tell you all about that fossil and when it was found, where it was found, how long ago, what is the lifestyle these uh, humans had. You can find out all about our ancestors history, uh, at least what is known to science from this page on human evolution of the Smithsonian Museum. One thing I would like to end with, we often think evolution is something in the textbooks. Evolution does not happen around us. We are no longer evolving, but is that true? I'm sure all of you have gone through at least one course of antibiotics in your life. And there is something that doctors will tell you, follow the routine of your medication properly, complete the course, otherwise there will be repercussions later. So basically the various microbes, they keep changing and they develop what is known as antibiotic resistance. So these microbes become stronger if you do not give them the entire course and kill them off completely, and they develop resistance. In fact, in today's medical world, antibiotic resistance, multidrug resistance are terms which are discussed all the time because with more and more complex medicines that we are uh, uh, you know, coming up with, antibiotics are also becoming a problem because the microbes are developing antibiotic resistance. And the last example that I want to talk about is what we have all been going through over the last three years. Everybody knows the coronavirus. And uh, it is now, you know, even uh, uh, on the streets, people would be talking about the variants. These are the four variants of concern from 2021. And after that, we had the Omicron, we had the Omicron, uh, the Delta, uh, whatever, Delta Cron. And now every other day you hear that there is a new variant. In fact, there's a lot of discussion that some of these variants, people are having COVID-like symptoms, but are being tested negative, probably because our detection mechanism is being avoided by the current variants of the virus. So what are these variants? These are exactly like the variations in nature that we have been talking about. So this is an evolutionary arms race but happening between us and the coronavirus. The coronavirus comes out with mechanisms by tweaking I mean, not actively, changes happen in the coronavirus. And some of these variants that occur are resistant to our uh, uh, drugs, uh, are giving us newer symptoms, are uh, uh, proliferating uh, you know, across the populations. And then we have to come up with a new detection mechanism, or sometimes we are worrying that we, have to might, we might have to come up with newer vaccines if the vaccines are being evaded by this virus. So this is evolution and action happening in our lives right in front of us. You cannot see the virus itself, but you are reading about the science which is happening and we are seeing evolution right in front of our eyes. Just to tell you what I do, I'm an evolutionary biologist, of course, but I actually study street dogs, dogs that you see around you anywhere in India. We try to un understand how dogs live, how they interact with each other, we understand their mating patterns, parental care behavior, interactions between pups, uh, interactions between dog groups. Why are they shouting in the middle of the night and they're, you know, ruining our sleep? It's something people ask all the time. They are uh, uh, you know, interacting to tell each other about their territorial boundaries. They're competing over food space mates. We try to understand how dogs interact with us because dogs are highly dependent on humans. We look at humans as resources for dogs and humans as threats because we also kill a large number of dogs every year. We also try to do studies to understand how smart dogs are, uh, how they are able to solve certain tasks. Like if you point, will they go find food in a bowl uh, like a pet dog does? And yes, street dogs are smart enough to do that. Their ability to distinguish between quantities, their ability to show preference of food. So anything that smells like meat, they're going to find it and eat it. And what are we doing by answering all of these proximate questions? We are looking at the big picture or the ultimate question to understand how the dogs became man's best friend or why did the dogs become dogs? You know, they came from wolf-like ancestors and they became something very different. Why? What made the dogs change into the dogs that we know of today? That is the evolutionary question that we are trying to understand at the dog lab at Isar Kolkata. And anyone who wants to gain an experience working with us is most welcome to write to me. We often take virtual interns. We do citizen science projects. So anyone who likes dogs, write back to me and I'll get back to you. Thank you for your attendance. Thanks for the organizers uh, for asking me to come and talk to you. And I'm open to taking questions. Yeah. Uh... बच्चों जो भी कोई क्वेश्चन पूछना चाहते हो आप 
चैट में टाइप कर दीजिए या फिर रेज योर हैंड्स हम आपको अनम्यूट कर देंगे कैन आई सी ऑल ऑफ यू प्लीज इफ यू डोंट माइंड स्विचिंग ऑन योर वीडियोस अपने वीडियोस स्विच ऑफ करेंगे बच्चे ताकि मुझे लगे मैं कंप्यूटर के साथ बात नहीं कर रही थी लुकिंग सो इट्स फाइन Yes, we can see Kohenur Jeet, we can see Sabjot, we can see Pavandeep, Sandeep. All of you, come on, switch on your cameras. किसी ने मुझे लिखा था, please speak Punjabi. Sorry, I don't speak Punjabi. <laughs> Hindi आती है, Punjabi तो नहीं आती है. हाँ, if you have questions. Okay, questions. जिसके भी questions हैं, please raise your hands. या फिर आप chat में type करो. And raise use करो, we can ask you. हाँ. I think there are no questions, but we had a very interactive session in between. Genes be modified, or not? Ha. So somebody is asking if genes are being modified. Yes. So how do these variations come? हमारे bodies में हमें मालूम है अभी Darwin के time में genes का पता नहीं था. Ah, genetics का field शुरू हुआ है उनके book के fifty years बाद. ठीक है. तो Mendel ने काम किया था पर उनका काम के बारे में किसी को नहीं पता था. तो ah अभी हम जानते हैं कि इतने जो वेरिएशन है ये इसलिए है कि जीन्स अलग अलग है हमारे बॉडीज में तो आ, मान लीजिए कि आ, किसी का आ, ब्लैक हेयर है तो किसी का थोड़ा ब्राउनिश हेयर है इसलिए है कि हमारे जीन्स अलग है को, हमारे स्किन कलर्स अलग होते हैं क्योंकि हमारे जीन्स अलग है तो सारा जो कोड है कि एक मॉर्फोलॉजी एक एक किस किसका कलर uh, क्या होगा किसका यू नो बॉडी शेप क्या होगा लीफ का पैटर्न क्या होगा सब कुछ एक्चुअली जीन्स में ही कोडेड है तो चेंज जब होगा तो जीन में ही होगा जिसको हम म्यूटेशन बोलते हैं ओके सो देयर आर नो रेज्ड हैंड्स सो इट्स टाइम टू रैप अप so thank you dr anita for sparing your valuable time and sharing with us this, with this valuable information okay uh, there is a question yes. ma'am do you also I study i study everything about dogs but not pet dogs stray dogs only ha which character we exhibit control this is exactly what happens in artificial selection so jo jo breeders hai wo kya karte hai wo aise characters jin dogs mein hai aur jin animals mein hai unko leke hi breeding karte hai baaki ko breed nahi karte to kuch generations ke baad aapko dikhai deta hai ki mujhe chahiye tha ki ek friendly dog animal ho to abhi friendly animal mil raha hai okay koi aur question any other question but isn't it wrong isn't it wrong yes very ethical question uh, actually uh, historically hum hamare ancestors ne jab breeding chalu kiya tha tab to unko malum bhi nahi tha ki kya ho raha hai par abhi aapko agar breed karna hai aapko bahut permissions lena padega lena padega aur uh, abhi jo breeders hote hain unko aisa allow nahi kiya jata hai ki wo experiment kare jo जो डॉग्स है उनका ही ब्रीडिंग होता है वो भी रॉन्ग है एक्चुअली आपको मालूम है जो बुल डॉग होते हैं बुल डॉग देखे होंगे ना आप फोटोज में एटलीस्ट देखे होंगे उसका ऐसा नाक होता है नाक दिखता ही नहीं है और बहुत वो ऐसा करते हैं ना तो लोग सोचते हैं कि वो बहुत गुस्से में है तो बुल डॉग बहुत गुस्से वाला डॉग्स होते हैं ऐसा माना जाता था पर अभी जो पता चला है कि ये आर्टिफिशियल ब्रीडिंग के वजह से क्या हुआ है बुलडॉग का वो जो फेस आया है ना स्ट्रक्चर उसके वजह से उसका जो नेजल पैसेज है और एयर पैसेज है वो बिल्कुल टेरा मेरा हो गया है तो वो बेचारा हाँपता रहता है क्योंकि वो सांस नहीं लेने पा ले पाता है अच्छी तरह से इसलिए उसका वो पैंटिंग होता है इसलिए नहीं कि उसको गुस्सा है हाँ 
और बुलडॉग्स ऐसा ऐसा एक अजीब सा बना दिया है हम लोगों ने कि बुलडॉग का अपना जो पपीज होते हैं वो अपने पपीज को डिलीवर नहीं कर पाते तो बुलडॉग के लिए हमेशा सी सेक्शन करके पपीज को निकालना होता है वेट्स को तो ये नेचुरल तो है नहीं ये अननेचुरल है और एक्चुअली अभी यूरोप में ना काफी सारे कंट्रीज में बुलडॉग ब्रीडिंग को बैन कर दिया गया है कि एथिकल नहीं है तो जो ब्रीडर्स है उनको भी सोचना चाहिए और जो ओनर्स है उनको भी सोचना चाहिए कि मैं क्यों करूं ऐसा मैं एक एनिमल का यू नो क्या मैं कैसे इसको ऐसा यू नो पेन में रख सकती हूँ पर इसमें बहुत मनी भी है तो अभी अब अभी क्या होता है अलग अलग कंट्रीज में लोग अलग अलग डिसीजन लेते हैं तो यूरोपियन कंट्रीज बहुत सारी कंट्रीज अभी बुलडॉग बैन कर रहे हैं तो दिस इज जस्ट एन एग्जाम्पल can see a lot of questions coming up wait what is difference between evolution and reproduction okay evolution jo process hai wo bahut long term process hai bahut dheere dheere hota hai aur most of the time 100 hazaron saalon ke baad pata chalta hai ki kuch change hua hai bacteria virus ki tarah itna jaldi change to baaki animals plants mein nahi hota hai virus mein jaisa hum bol sakte hai ki evolution ho raha hai par abhi इवॉल्व करके वो नया नया स्पीशीज नहीं बनाए अभी भी कोरोना वायरस ही है पर उसका वेरिएशन सारा है कि एक पर्टिकुलर वेरिएंट है जो एक तरह का बीमारी पैदा कर रहे हैं पर अगर ऐसा हो गया कि कोरोना वायरस चेंज होके कोई और तरह तरीका का वायरस बन गया जो बिल्कुल ही अलग है मेजर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स कोरोना वायरस जैसा है ही नहीं तब हम बोलेंगे कि एवोल्यूशन हुआ है तो एवोल्यूशन इज अ लॉन्ग टर्म प्रोसेस स्लो प्रोसेस तो जनरली आप अभी देख के नहीं बता सकते कि हाँ इवॉल्व होके बनाए एक जनरेशन में इवॉल्व नहीं होता है और क्योंकि वायरस बैक्टीरिया इनका जेनरेशन टाइम कम होता है कि ऐसे कुछ बैक्टीरिया है जो पंद्रह घंटे में दूसरा जनरेशन हो जाते हैं तो जितना जल्दी जेनरेशन होंगे क्यों होता है ये चेंजेस म्यूटेशन क्या है एरर्स इन रिप्रोडक्शन ऑफ जीन्स तो जब जीन बन रहा है एक से दूसरा कॉपी हो रहा है कॉपिंग एरर हो जाता है कभी कभी तो कॉपिंग एरर के लिए अगले स्टेप्स में एरर हो जाते हैं करके म्यूटेशन होते हैं तो उसका जो अक्यूमुलेशन है वो जितना जितने जनरेशन जाते रहेंगे उतना ज्यादा होता रहेगा और उतना ज्यादा हमें दिखेगा कोई और सवाल बेटा नो मोर क्वेश्चन पार्टिसिपेंट्स फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस फॉर द टॉक थैंक यू एवरी वन